the world's oldest democracy to the world's largest democracy. However, he did not reveal the extent to which those claims, which I see as being more about capitalism than about democracy, um, those claims veil the violence and the repression which both countries mobilize against those who are truly fighting for justice. And so in this context, I want to acknowledge uh, the three-day festival that is taking place here in Delhi, organized around the demand for freedom for Dr. Vinayak Sen. And um, again, my visit coincides with these activities uh, organized by artists and intellectuals and cultural workers. Uh, and I had the opportunity to spend uh, a short time, a brief time, at the gathering yesterday. Uh, and so I want to use this opportunity to express my deepest solidarity with those who are challenging the conviction of Dr. Benayek Sen under the Sedition Law. Uh, this Sedition Act not only recapitulates the repression of the colonial era, but it also reflects the assaults on people's rights and liberties that have intensified during the first part of the 21st century um, in connection with the Bush administration's war on terror. So you have the Sedition Act, right? And the Unlawful Activities Act, am I right? And we have the Patriot Act. And Dr. Bernayek Sin, who is a committed medical doctor, a civil rights activist, an upholder of human rights, should be released. Uh, and I don't know whether I can pronounce this correctly when I say by the state of um, uh, Chattisgarh. Is that? You understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. His sentence should be immediately suspended, and he should be released on bail. As his wife, Alina Sin, whom I had the opportunity to uh, talk with yesterday morning um, over breakfast, as she points out, the struggle is not only about her husband, but rather it challenges the attempt by the state to use terror and violence to suppress the quest for justice. And so I say, free Dr. Benayek Sen. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King, who was also a political prisoner, maybe some of you have read his letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, uh, engaged in very early attempts to create ties between oppressed communities in India, and oppressed people in the US. Uh, in the days that I've been here, I've had fascinating discussions. I'm still trying to absorb uh, uh, the meaning of you know, all of the conversations I've had over the last uh, three or four days about discussions about both the differences and the similarities between caste and race. Uh, and of course, while the circumstances of the uh, Dalit people are quite different from those of black people in the US, black people, I point to Dr. Du Bois, have been inspired by Dr. Ambekar and the struggle for Dalit equality. And then the Dalit people, in turn, have been inspired by black struggles in the US for liberation. And we can point to the Dalit Panthers who bear witness to that transnational connection. Many of us who were active in the freedom movement of the 1960s and the 1970s um, were absolutely convinced that we would successfully achieve a world without racism, without sexism, 
without economic exploitation. We truly believe that such a revolution was possible. And many of us believed as we joined hands with our comrades and sisters and brothers all over the world that we would eventually, and we thought at least in the 20th century, eliminate capitalism from the planet. Some of you remember, <laughs> right? <laughs> Today, the structures of global capitalism and the insinuation of neoliberal ideologies into every aspect of people's lives might, in retrospect, make it appear that we were utterly naive regarding our collective capacity to bring about radical transformation. And perhaps we were naive, but I don't think it was a misplaced naivete. Perhaps we did not make the revolution we thought we were making, but our passionate activism did lead to earth-changing, earth-shaking changes in the world. And I'm very proud to say that I was a part of that movement. Uh, that perhaps didn't transform the world in the way we wanted it to and expected it to, but nonetheless, uh, we inhabit a very different uh, uh, space today. In the United States, what we have achieved by way of racial and gender justice can be clearly attributed to our collective activism. Unfortunately, however, within the context of neoliberal individualism, many of these victories have been individualized uh, so that um, whereas we imagine the uplift of communities, well, whereas we imagine and struggle for structural change, that change has been experienced largely by individuals. And so now we see more black people in positions of power than we ever could have imagined. More CEOs, more black CEOs, black college presidents, uh, black um, uh, elected representatives, uh, including the current black president, uh, who just announced that he will be running again in the 2012 election, he announced yesterday, I believe. The neoliberal obsession with individualism, its inability to apprehend communities and collectives results in the current notions uh, of um, post-civil rights the current assumptions about the character of the historical era, um, at least in the US, it is ca often characterized as a post-civil rights era. Civil rights has been achieved. That struggle can be securely relegated to the past and can be incorporated into the official narrative about democracy in the US. Barack Obama's uh, um, notion of uh, coming from the world's oldest democracy. Uh, you know, there's some people who talk about uh, other places, uh, like, you know, Greece and, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> uh, so it's, the, the era is characterized as a post-civil rights era, but also a post-feminist era, right? I don't know whether you have that concept, whether that notion circulates here uh, as well, uh, post-feminism. Um, and then there's post-socialism, right? I, I, I suppose this period uh, will be seen by some historians as the post-period, right? <laughs> And as you know, one of the major ideological